Hey, have you ever wondered about the importance of building a personal brand? Maybe you think that's a marketing strategy for really successful people. Well, time to rethink that one, team. My guest today escaped the corporate cubicle and has very quickly built a successful small business thanks to guess what? (laughs) Yeah, his personal brand. Well, I said welcome to a small business marketing show. Successful small business owners share their souls to take your marketing straight to the lead. Now, here's your host, Mr. Tim Bowie. And welcome back, listeners, to another episode of Australia's number one marketing show. I'm your host, Timbo Reed. You, though, yeah, so much more importantly, you're a motivated business owner and you're ready. You are ready right at this very minute to crank out some great marketing that's going to build that baby of yours into the empire it deserves to be. So welcome back. If it's your first time, stick with me. Yeah, I'm excitable. I love marketing. That's why I do this show every week. If you're back for like your hundredth or maybe your two hundredth time, because this is episode 292, by the way, then good on you for staying motivated. Hey, big show today. Got a financial planner and past guest, Charles Badenak. He's joining us again. He uh, spoke with us last time when he was in the cubicle. Well, he's escaped the cubicle about 150 episodes down the track, and he is going to talk about personal branding plus a whole lot of other wonderful marketing insights because he's built a successful small business of his own in no small part thanks to some very clever marketing. I have a question from a listener who's operating in a niche, and he's asking how to better target his prospects. I've got one big bit of information for him, advice I should say, and I've got a very flirtatious motivational marketing quote for you. Hey, today's show lovingly brought to you by the very, very, very good folks at Net Registry. They'll get your online marketing sorted and they have some exclusive, exclusive? No, doesn't work. Not a word, exclusive, exclusive listener packages over at netregistry.com forward slash Timbo, yeah, they're just for you, including an SEO booster pack where they have dropped the setup fee. Don't tell anyone, right? That is just for small business, big marketing listeners. Okay, cool. Okay. Hey, as per usual, there is marketing G-O-L-D dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. Do you need a speaker for your next conference? Recommend Timbo to your event organiser. Or better still, book him. Tim Reid. That's R-E-I-D dot com dot A-U. Righto, let's get stuck into this listener question. I don't have a name for this listener. They just call themselves Amplify This 200. But it's a good question and some lovely feedback up front. Uh, They say, hey, Timbo, firstly, thanks for putting on a great podcast. My pleasure. I usually listen to your podcast while I am out marketing. In fact, letterbox dropping. Good on you, hey? That's a motivated business owner that does their own letterbox drops. I run two businesses. G4, Guitar School's Blair Athol. That's a weird long name. And an audio visual company, Amplify This 200 Productions. It's kind of a weird name too. Hmm. Maybe they help you stand out in a crowded marketplace. From listening to your podcast, I've gained so many ideas. I think the biggest of some of the latest episodes has been blogging. This is something I've just started, released my first blog just the other day. Not sure how many hits it's had, but that's okay because I've just started it. Well, just on that point, amplify this 200. Uh, Don't look at the scoreboard. Just keep blogging. Find your voice, get your eye in, share your knowledge, put it out there. Don't worry about the scoreboard. You'll get the runs on the board, hey? It takes time. Certainly don't look at the scoreboard in the first six months. That's my advice. Back to this question. My question to you is, Timbo, since I'm part of such a a niche market, how can I target my marketing better to people who are looking for my services? This is an excellent question. 
And I have a very simple answer. Whether you are niche or mass marketing, simply work hard at knowing your prospects better than your competition, better than anyone else. Know them intimately. This is part of the brand character work that you need to do on your business, right? Everyone listening needs to do on their business. How do you do it? Get clear on the demographics. That's boring. You know, age, sex, income, education, location, that stuff. Tick those boxes real quick. Then get into the psychographic questions. What's their most expensive problem that they have that you can solve? How do, you, how do they feel about the industry in which you operate? What keeps them up at night? What excites them? Answer these questions and then get into the sociographic. I don't even know if that's a word. Sociographic questions like where do they get their information from? Who do they listen to? How do they, where do they get their entertainment? Where do they go out? What brands do they like? Start to get to know your prospects so intimately that you could then write marketing messages, write marketing copy, produce helpful marketing content that hits them right between the eyes, that has you talking to them as if you know them as a mate, right? I actually don't call them your target audience or your target market. I call them your best mates, that group of people that have the highest propensity to want to buy from you. And, you know, once you know this information, the marketing ideas really will flow and your messaging will be so much more empathetic. Um, Once you have this clarity around your prospects, amplify this, (laughs) weird name still, Um, share it with everyone right, who is responsible for growing your business. That's how you get clarity around your target market, around your best mates in order to grow market. The marketing ideas will flow, I promise you, all right? So great question. Hey, if you want to get a mention on the show and you want me to answer your marketing question, all you have to do is head over to iTunes, leave a listener review, add your marketing question there plus your website and I will give you my answer and a little bit of exposure. Some wise soul once said, doing business without marketing is like winking at a girl in the dark. You know what you're doing, (laughs) but nobody else does. (whistles) All right, let's get stuck into today's guest, Charles Badenak. Main Street Financial is his business. And Charles was a past guest on this show on episode 145. In fact, we shared the same stage at a conference about three or four years ago. Um, In that episode, he talked about how he was using content marketing to successfully navigate his way through the global financial crisis of those many years ago. And he did it really successfully. And it was such a great interview. I'll put a link in the show notes to that interview because it's it's, it's as relevant today um, as it was back then, you know, and you've got to listen to some of the very clever things he was doing. Now, back then he was an employee. Yeah, he was stuck in the cubicle. Now he started his own successful financial planning business. Nice little boutique business down in Tasmania. So sit back and have a listen as Charles explains how and why he escaped the cubicle. (laughs) That's obvious. Um, How he set up the marketing for his new business. How his personal brand contributed to and sped up the success that he's now having. And there's plenty more marketing gold dripping from this interview. I started off by asking Charles, <laughs> with limited success, what's on his bucket list? My bucket list is very long, um, Timbo, but I suppose the first and most important thing on my bucket list at the moment is to build a sustainable business. Um, Come on, mate. Give me the personal one. Give me the, you know, the bungee jump kind of ideas. Oh, I'm not too – I'm scared of heights. I get, tra- get scared changing a light globe at home, let alone a bungee jump. <laughs> What do you? You must be some trick. Because here's the thing: as a financial advisor, do you ever look at yourself as someone who helps people tick things off their bucket list? Oh, we certainly do, and it's certainly something that's raised a lot. But what I suppose I've become more conscious of as I get older is rather than um, uh, buying presents, is buying experiences. So yeah, right. Um, so for my wife, for example, whenever it's a birthday, no longer does she get any jewellery; it's an experience. So. Um, 
you know, this year I took her over to Melbourne for cats, for example. So, um, mate, you are the eternal romantic. Oh, I'm not sure about that. I think she's very talented. It's kind of interesting, though, that whole experience thing. I mean, it works in marketing. It works <laughs> to keeping your wife happy. Um, it is powerful because it's it's full of emotion. Yeah, we actually I went to a conference a couple of years ago, and one of the speakers he talked about a happy life. And one of the key things he... he happy spoke life about, or happy wife? Oh, happy life. But uh, he spoke about one of the key things for happy life was beyond a certain amount of money, it doesn't buy you any more happiness. But it's mm. actually about the experiences you have and the memories you share. Yeah, and I right. suppose that's something I've been very conscious of as I've got older. It's interesting. Um, we're completely going to digress here, but it's interesting. I was talking to one of my sons just last night about how uh, Mark Zuckerberg's given away something like 90% of his fortune over the course of the coming years, which equates to, I think the number was $45 billion. And uh, we were just talking about, you know, like how much is enough? Like how much do we need as human beings? You must kind of reflect on that a lot too in your job. Yeah, and I think we actually need less than what you really think we do because yeah. a lot of the things in life that we really value are for free. So whether it's spending time with family or friends, I mean, you don't necessarily need um, you know, $3 million to retire nowadays. Mm. Mm. Very true. We moved house uh, a month or two ago, Charles, and the amount of stuff I just threw out because it's like, you know what? Yeah, like it's nice to have but I don't need it whether it be a gadget or a bit of furniture or I remember Steve Jobs, I think, lived in a very zen-type house where I think he might have, might have had two pieces of furniture. Interesting. Nothing to do with small business marketing, though, Charles, so let's get on to that. Uh, you still didn't tell me what's on your bucket list, but I will continue to prod and poke as we go along, mate. Now, since we last spoke, you did escape the cubicle. Well done to you, and you started your own business. What's the business about, and how was that escape? Um. Well, I have escaped, uh, Timbo, sort of uh, early 40s. Uh, I thought it was now or never. I, I think um, I certainly enjoyed my time in the cosy corporate cubicle, <laughs> but I didn't want to sit back in sort of 20 years' time and wonder what if. Yeah. Um, I think you know, your big's not necessarily better with all professional services, whether it's law, accounting, finance, engineering. It's sort of like the individual relationships that count. Mm-hmm. You don't necessarily need the big corporate around you to achieve that. And I think technology has been a great leveller for small business, so mm-hmm. we can actually compete on a scale like never before. What's the business you started? Well, obviously, it's financial planning business. Um, yeah, we started a business called Main Street Financial Solutions, um, which is a boutique financial planning business based here in Hobart. So, so right there, no shortage of financial planning businesses around. What made you think, sitting in the mahogany office in your corporate job, that you could start a business that was going to be different to all the others? <laughs> Uh, well, I suppose we always try to do the things that other people won't do to get the results that other people won't get. Um, so whether that's you know, particularly at a marketing front um, and at a client engagement level, um, we're very sort of you're committed to what we do and passionate. We work as a team. And you're a big boy. I'm going to pull you up on that because I am. I love that. I love the the quote. Uh, you do the things others won't do to get the results others won't get. Um, give me an example of that. Okay, so we're involved with a client um, who uh, runs a business. So we actually sat on the board of that business um, and we've helped, this is Rebecca and I'm my business partner, and we actually helped transition that business and help facilitate the sale of that business to a third party. Yeah, right. Now, that's something your traditional financial planner wouldn't do. Nice. Was that a suggestion of yours? Uh, yeah, it was. And I, I suppose what we've tried, to do is not try and be all things to all people. Whilst Main Street can be a little bit sort of misleading in a sense, um, we try to build sort of, you know, close relationships with fewer clients. So, you know, within financial services that we are potentially subject to some severe disruption going forward. So if you do try to be all things to all people and just compete on price, that's where you're going to come unstuck. Yeah, right, okay. So um, you've gone and started Main Street uh, Financial. You've jumped out of the queue. How, how was the escape for you? Like, Because it, it is a big jump going from that, well, I think you said that comfortable kind of corporate life, which many of us have had, into starting your own. Did you feel free? Was it scary? Was, uh, well, was I, the... I suppose going from the known to the unknown and leaving your comfort zone is always a challenge for all of us. And... Um, but if I didn't do it, I'd be stuck in a job that you know, I wasn't enjoying in an ever-changing world that really I couldn't control. Mm. Um, so it was liberating. 
happening, um, exciting, uh, frightening. I mean, I've got three children and the, the usual demands that, that they place on you, so I need to work, I enjoy my work. I, I just wasn't enjoying that corporate environment. Yeah. Gotcha. So you go and start the business. What, what have you got to do? What, clearly, from a marketing perspective, you are starting with a. You didn't buy a business. You started one from scratch. You've got a. You've got a white canvas in front of you, Charles. Um, what are we talking? I mean, how did you go about pulling all the marketing together, starting with the name? Um, well, with the name, we wanted something that was a little bit sort of catchy. We, we very much. Um, yeah, yeah, we work in, in Hobart. It's a. Um, it's a smaller city than, than the rest of Australia, so we wanted something a little bit sort of catchy that. Um, was a little bit of a play on words. Um, so that's where Main Street came up. Mm-hmm. Uh, we actually, when whenever you leave financial services, it's it's pretty standard. As soon as you resign, you nearly tear a hamstring as you walk out the door. So that happened. <laughs> um, you can't work for a period. So we weren't able to work for six months, which mm-hmm. really gave us six months sitting in a room, you know, brainstorming. So my business partner and I, basically, we got dressed as if we were going to work in a suit and things. And we, we hired a room and we just sort of worked every day on that. And what we over that six months, we spent a lot of time on systems, processes, and marketing. Mate, that, what, what a luxury to have that six months sort of hiatus where you, you you weren't able to practice your craft, so you could work on the marketing. I mean, you always being paid for that either, Tim. I was pretty keen to sort of uh, hit the ground running when um, when I was able to work again. So so we basically had a whiteboard and just worked through everything. So we'd um, you know, registered the digital assets. You know, we built the website. We had a marketing plan in terms of what we were doing because as a Greenfields business, it was we, we thought actually um, getting the clients would be the hard bit, but that's actually been the easy bit. And this probably alludes to you, the, the main theme of this presentation is your personal brand. Is yeah, that, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, hold that thought because I want to come to that very shortly. But you're saying... Uh, I just want to go back to that six months in the bunker where you're pulling it all together. And did you find – because there are things – I mean, obvious things like you've got to get a name, you've got to get a logo, you've got to get all your corporate identity designed, you've got to get a website, you've got to get copy, sales brochures, all that type of stuff. Did you find any of that challenging or was it all pretty much par for the course? Well, actually, it was it – was, um, I suppose I often equate it to like you're changing football teams mid-career. <laughs> It sort of gave us a new lease on life. We're pretty pumped and pretty yeah, passionate. Yeah, right. So we actually we actually enjoyed the process. So yeah, we used a lot of the you know the tools that you've raised in your show, for example, like ninety nine designs for the logo. We did a couple of ebooks. All of those um, you know used the Philippines offshore solution for yeah, the website, right. for example. So it was we just had a big checklist that we just worked through with timelines and deadlines, and it, it worked pretty well. It's the thing we love about small business, hey? If it's, it's yours. I mean, effectively, what you're doing, I always draw the analogy. I mean, you're effectively like you're naming your baby and starting to dress it and teach it to walk, and it's exciting times, right? Yeah, it has been, and certainly as you sort of start, we've been going sort of 18 months, so we're still very new into the journey, I suppose, but... We're starting to build some momentum. You know, our staff numbers have increased. You know, obviously, the revenue's increased. You know, we've bought a building. We've done a whole lot of things. And I look back um, over the last 18 months and sometimes have to pinch myself in terms of what's, uh, what's transpired. Hey, listeners, I'm chatting with financial planner Charles Badenak, founder of Main Street Financial. Before I ask Charles to take us inside the world of his personal brand, here's a word from a business that can lighten your marketing load. Support for this show comes from NetRegistry. Recently, I was Skyping it up with Verity Ma, their chief marketing officer, when the line deteriorated. She thought it may be because she had loads of browsers open, at which point I'm like, why so many browsers? Well, because websites appear differently on different browsers. So if I run multiple, then I can get a sense of how our websites are tracking across different browsers and customers' websites. Net Registry, where attention to detail rules. Visit netregistry.com.au forward slash Timbo for a website that works on, well, all browsers. Hey, now, Charles, personal branding, mate, it's played a big part in your journey, both in your corporate life and now in your small business life. Um, tell us about that. Okay, well, I suppose I was very conscious, you know, back in, back in 2008 when the GFC hit, I was very conscious that I didn't really have a personal brand. Um, and I saw the great change that that brought to the industry. So from sort of 2008, I've really sort of focused on building a, a personal brand um, that, that I suppose is transferable. Um, Let's define that. What do you what when you talk about a personal brand versus a business brand? What do you mean? Well, I suppose a personal brand is something that. Um, but I was very conscious to register all my digital assets, for example. So, mm-hmm. you know, a website, 
you know, the YouTube channel, all of the, the so, usual. So, so charlesbadenack.com.au, youtube.com forward slash Charles Badenack, all that type of stuff and creating yep. content that is yours, your own opinions, your own thoughts, your own musings. Yeah, and, you know, I, and I suppose the what I wanted to do was you know, to create an environment where people would actually know me in a sense. So um, you could actually, um, I am who Google says I am. So I can be a little bit, um, I suppose I try to use humour. Some would say not very well to know that. <laughs> Um, but that's part of my personality. Welcome, so whether, to, welcome to my world, mate. <laughs> so whether it's uh, when you're doing a, a federal budget update and I'm I'm in my gum boots standing in the water saying, you know, you know, most of you that last night's federal budget was about as exciting as watching grass grow or hmm. you know, all high and dry or whatever or you're know, coming out of coffins talking about the funeral industry, all of those sort of things. That's the nature of my personality. And right. I suppose a personal brand enables me to, to bring that out. So you had all these personal assets, these videos of you expressing opinions and educating and entertaining your clients. You had this is stuff we spoke about in a previous episode where you've got a you've had books, you would speak at conferences, and and I think what you found maybe you didn't realise I, I could see it when I first met you, but you had built. Uh, your own personal brand alongside the business that you're working for and now you've discovered that it's 100% transferable to your own business and it's an amazing asset that you can start with immediately. Yeah, no, it's worked pretty well. I mean, there was a period for six months where I had to take all those, um, some of the, a lot of those videos down when I had my previous employer's mm-hmm. clients and things. So I had to rebuild those from scratch. So that, that took a little bit of time. But even being offline for six months, like one of the, um, I think I was the only employee that's ever left there that was banned from social media for six months. So that was interesting. <laughs> but uh, it's actually quite a hard thing to break when you can't go something you enjoy. But anyway, that's another well, story. Can, how but, much um, can you tell us about that? Because uh, I am in the old social media. I mean, they're, they're, that feels very relaxing to be off social media for six months. Do you find it really, really hard, did you? Well, I suppose I, I use social media not just for work, but for, for social interaction, for news and a whole lot of other reasons. So I had to be very sort of careful what I did during mm-hmm. that period. But, but I just rebuilt it. And it, um, as I had the digital assets already, so I owned those digital assets, it, it wasn't terribly difficult. And I, know, I suppose I like the fact with a personal brand that, that I control it. I, I suppose it's also enabled me to you know, build credibility in a crowded marketplace mm-hmm. by being mm-hmm. different. Obviously, you distinguish yourself a little bit from... From the competition, there are a lot of financial advisors around us and uh, advisors that do a fantastic job for clients and it's a, it's a pretty competitive market. What, one of the things that I hear, I hear it in your industry all the time, but I hear it in other industries sometimes, is this notion of compliance, right? And let's broadly define compliance as um, there's only cer- there's certain things you can say and there's cer- certain things you can't say. You, you can't step over the line and moving into the, in, from your point of view, you can't start ex- expressing opinions around advice, you know, do this, do that. You've got to be broad. How do you manage that? Because it's, it, I know that it stops most people in many industries from embarking on the type of content marketing and personal branding that you do. Okay, well, a lot of the information I have out there is very general, okay? Where I, I actually deal um, a lot of – there's a lot of things I do offline. Um, so whether it's a, an unlisted YouTube video, which I send to clients, which is personal. Okay, which contains all of the disclaimers and all those things. And it's just, it's just the world we live in. You've got to work around it. I don't think it's an inhibitor for mm-hmm. what you do. You just um, need to do things slightly differently. And you know, the, the world's always changing. And I think as professionals, we need to change with it. And I've got this sort of thought that you need to um, improve what you do by 5 to 10% each year to keep up with the trade. You know, let's, let's just go a bit deeper on that because I reckon most business owners in any industry – acknowledge that the world is changing. And we'll talk, let's talk about the marketing world. Um, we're seeing a lot of changes. Uh, there's amazing things that we can do. There's never been a better time to market a small business. Uh, but this change creates this massive anxiety in them and they kind of, as a result, continue to do what they've always done. Are you one of these blokes who just kind of looks change in the eye and says, out of my way? Or how do you break through that? Well, I suppose I kind of love change, really. Um not a guy that will uh, sit in the same chair, have the same thing for lunch for the next 20 years. That's not me. So what we've done, we're, we're, example, we've got a business coach, for example, and one of the things that uh, she said to us is, look, uh, you're actually growing too quickly. Nice. I said, oh, I, didn't think, I didn't think that was a problem. She goes, well, I think we need to step back a bit. So what we've done over the last sort of four months is we've actually for four days a week we've worked in the business and on the fifth day we work on the business. So 
what we do, we have all of the staff coming in playing clothes on that day, and we have these things called rocks. So we all have a, a rock that we're responsible for, and it's about trying to make sure the business is more efficient and, and we can actually become more scalable to mm-hmm. an extent. And it's worked well because it gives all the staff ownership of, of an issue. I need you to just explain that rock thing a bit more, mate. Are you carrying around a rock all day? What, uh, uh, tell me more. Well, it's, it's just an expression we have. So we, we refer to them as rocks. So every three months we do a different rock. Right. So a rock might be your investment philosophy. It might be fixing up your intranet, for example. So we use you know Google Sites for our intranet, which really enables us to have um, – an intranet with Google search engine like capabilities. Yeah, right. If I compare what we've got as a small business in the internet versus what I had working for the big corporate, as sad as it seems, our, our internet is actually better. Love it. So someone carries that rock, that, say the intranet rock, for three months and it's their job to make it better over that course. Of, yeah, okay. Yeah. Good. And we have a, a, a sort of a weekly or Friday meeting on that. So they give us an update on where everyone's at and it's, it works pretty well. So, you know, we're always trying to make sure the car goes faster. Charles, um, personal branding, I, I want to now kind of figure out how you've taken this strong personal brand that you have in your industry in Tassie uh, and now integrated it into Main Street Financial's brand. Because at the end of the day, I guess what you don't want to do is, oh, I don't know, maybe you do. Do you want them to be completely uh, poles apart and separate or... Do they somehow blend at a point? And where is that point? Um, I, I suppose they're blending now. So the focus very much now is on the business. So whilst I have a personal uh, web page, a lot of that traffic that traffic is directed back to um, the Main Street website. It's basically my website with a lot of the Main Street pages on it. Yeah, okay. right. Uh, we have a... Um, we have an outsourced solution that we use in the Philippines that, that we pay a retainer fee. And one of, the, one of the roles they do is they give us a monthly report and where all our traffic's come from. And still my personal website is in the top three, always in the top three traffic um, sources for our website. Hmm. So keen to, sort of, I suppose, reduce that over time. Uh, um, why? As long as you're getting traffic to... As long as you're get, people are visiting your website and then bouncing off to your business website, that's okay, isn't it? It is okay, but I suppose we're trying to build a business, not a yeah, personal yeah, yeah. brand. So if we look at the saleability of, of a business in you know, 5, 10, 15 years' time, you know, it's the business you, you want to have the, the identity more than the individual. How the are you you're, – you're a big one for content marketing. You're a big one for helpful marketing, as I talk about. And how what, – what are you putting on – what is it, charlesbadenack.com.au – versus what are you putting over at Main Street Financial website? Well, they're nearly one in the same in a sense. Um, in the but you're not, you're, not, you're not mirroring the content, are you? Well, if, I'm, if so, I do a video, for example, for you know, YouTube's a classic example. So I've got a personal YouTube channel and we've got a Main Street channel. So where I've done a video for Main Street, it's actually it goes on my personal channel as well. Mm-hmm. And I've also been careful. Let's say, for example, you I do a presentation for someone. I'll actually pay a guy to come and record it as well. So I'll actually upload that to my personal channel rather than Brilliant. mainstream. And then someone may want, let's say someone wants to know, you know, wants to know how you how you present, for example, I'll send them through a couple of the links so they can have a look at it. And that, that's worked pretty well. So that's um, like at, at a personal level, for example, in 2014 when I was on gardening leave, I went had two weeks in New Zealand talking to the financial advisors mm-hmm. over there. Um, and that's how that opportunity arose. Yeah, I like that. The whole re- the whole repurposing of content or capturing content in the first place because I mean, you know, you're doing some some speaking gigs that can either go out into the ether and never be heard again or you capture it once and for all and and put it on your website, carve it up, uh, maybe transcribe it, maybe turn it into some pieces of audio. There's a whole lot of stuff you could do with that. Uh, you, you love this stuff, don't you? I do, Timbo. I do. I, I'm always a bit of a nerd. You can well, I don't tell. think it's uh, – I'll pull you up on that. I don't think it's nerdy. Like I think it's a limiting belief that many business owners have that this modern world of marketing is for the geeky business owner because, you know, you've got to get the camera and the microphone and you've got to do, you know, videos and you've got to get fancy websites. And I think that's kind of like yeah, – I mean, for the, nerd, for the nerdy business owner, it's just – it's you know, it's made in heaven, right? But I don't think, again, it should stop others from embarking on it. Yeah, and things are getting simple. Like, like one, of the, uh, one of the tools we've just subscribed is Zoom for video oh, yeah. conferencing. So it works very much like Skype, but you can have sort of four or five there and um, you can record the meetings, you can show people your screen. And it's, I find that a, 
that's a fantastic tool for $130 a yeah, year. Actually, someone only, oh, only business. referred that to me yesterday. My go-to webinar subscription um, finished and I thought I'm not going to renew that and uh, I'm looking at Zoom and there's also another one I think called Join Me, which is um, – and then you've got stuff like Blurb. Uh, not Blurb. Um, what's the other? Blab. Blab's just come online and this – I mean, it's amazing. That, that world is changing you know, a line, just that little kind of corner of the marketing world. There's so much we can do. What, um, you, you've been very good, I mean, you've been very good at attracting clients with the new business, Charles. You, uh, you know, growth is not a problem. What's your trick? What's your secret source to retaining clients? Because the lifetime value of well, any business's client is high. Uh, in your industry, it is particularly high. What's your secret source to retention? I suppose in any professional services business, who clients will deal with, they know you, they like you and they trust you. And I suppose it's constantly doing things to actually reinforce those values. So reinforcing that trust. So, for example, if um, and going above and beyond what other people would do. So whether it's you know, buying a property, being involved in the negotiations with them, whether it's being a sounding board as part like a life coach, I mean, it's I suppose it's constantly reinforcing those three things. Mm-hmm. Do, do, you, do you use the expression one percenters? Oh, very much so. Yeah, we use that. we love that one. So. Do you? Have, have you got a strategy behind it? Because I, I love one percenters too. Every time I hear a one percenters are incredibly shareable, and they and they they can be quite viral uh, when done right. Because us marketers love to share them around. One uh, percenter being defined as just you know that that extra little bit that makes a client sit up and take notice and go, "Wow, look what they just did for me." Is it is it like a is it an overt strategy that you guys have, or that they just happen every now and then? Uh, well, I have, a, I have a book in my um, desk, which I call the Gold Nugget Book. So whenever I come up with an idea, I put it in there. <laughs> and about once a month when we have our team meeting, I actually go through these and we try to implement some of them. So it can be as simple, and you know, this is a lot of people would do this, but you know, what sort of having a, a, a proper coffee machine in the office and knowing what sort of coffee people drink, yeah, right. having sort of minties and things in the, in the lunchroom, having... You know, in the lunchroom, you have pictures of the staff doing things. So we've got um, one of our staff members is a bit of a surfer. So we've got a picture of her with a surfboard, for example. Um, you wacky, you wacky guy. But actually, it's a it's a great conversation piece, <laughs> and it makes the staff feel very much part of the, the team, and which is what they are. And yeah, it, it works well. And last year, we went on a um, for Christmas. I, I took them up on a light plane flight around Hobart, and it was and it just. So on such a high uh, when we got back and had lunch that um, we had a photo of it. Now it's on our wall, and it's and it's a great memory of our journey. Brilliant. Well, it shows you have fun. It shows you're human. You know, so these financial advisors can sometimes seem. Oh, 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 now I'm going to get a whole lot of financial advisors. I was going to say unhuman, but you know what I mean. Like uh, they can often be because you you deal in a space that is quite complicated and technical. So the kind of marketing that you're doing is humanising yourself and making you more approachable, I think. Yeah, no, I think there's an expectation now with clients that you've actually got those qualifications. And like, yeah. So when they come in the door, they've, they've actually already done their research on you. They've already Googled you and they, they sort of know a bit about you. So that's already um, established that. Whereas if we go back you know, 10 or 15 years, you had to actually establish that on a one-on-one basis with a client, but it's different now. Yeah, I hear. Hey, uh, Charles, I know uh, I, I don't normally ask my guests this, but I know you did some wonderful preparation for this chat um, as you uh, as you like to do. Is there any points that I haven't covered that you would love to share around personal branding? <laughs> no, not really, Timbo. <laughs> Got it. I, good, so really. I told you we'd get there. All pretty good, really. <laughs> I, I, I suppose... Um, yeah. Is, is there is there one thing? Is there one thing? Because you, you're doing some good stuff. Uh, you continue to do some good stuff. Marketing for you is a hobby. You're one of these few people that I that I. It is absolutely something that you enjoy doing in order to grow that baby of yours into the empire it deserves to be. As I say, but is there one thing that you are tempted to try? But you just maybe you haven't got the courage or. You don't know for some reason you just can't seem to do it. Well, I suppose I've always adopted a philosophy. I've got a fish where the fish are, and one of the problems I've had is I've actually been a bit far ahead of where the fish are in a sense. So I embraced YouTube before clients were on YouTube. Um, so I've had to sort of pull back a bit and really focus on where the clients are. Mm-hmm. Where are they? Well, most of, well, LinkedIn's a very popular platform. Also, um, you know, Facebook for more. I don't know if you've ever seen some of our Facebook posts, but they're quite sort of lighthearted. Like, mm-hmm. You know, if you um, often use the analogy, you know, if we put something serious on Facebook, it's like turning up to a party on a Saturday night with a dictionary and expecting people to talk to you. It's just not going to happen. 
I do like I do like that one. Hey, you are quite a funny guy. Uh, this is really interesting because that whole concept of you know putting that kind of stuff on Facebook again. There's a lot of business owners who go really. So what? And, and I'm I'm not the marketing guy who says get on Facebook or get on Twitter. But if you are going to, you do have to have those generally light conversations. And there's business owners going, but do I really need to kind of post funnies or do I, can't I just talk about my business? And the answer is no. So because... you can just be, as, as an example, we bought, uh, we bought a video arcade game from, uh, from Gumtree, Timbo, which Love it. plays a lot of the favourites from the late 80s and early 90s, which you're always very familiar with, like myself. Sit down or stand up? Uh, sit down with the two nice. schools next to it. And um, yeah. yeah, it's got 60 games, cost us a grand total of $1,000. And it's a crack up. Like we um, we have a competition every Friday. We might be playing for a, a bath bomb or a, a Guinness <laughs> six pack or something like that. And we have a like a tennis bomb. bomb. A bath bomb. Jeez, did you, have you have you ever won a bath bomb? Well, I'm not sure it'd be good for me, but the, the girls in the office <laughs> like it. So we're an equal opportunity employer, Timbo. So we've got to keep the prizes sort of fifty fifty a bit. So, but we put a Facebook post about that, for example, or Penny. Yeah. Um, one of our staff, she's a national swimming champion. So that went on them, and she swims like four k a morning and stuff like. She's a bit of a superstar. So yeah, right. You know, really personalising it, and clients will come in and raise those issues. And we've even had clients come in and say, "Look, could you mind if I have a game on your game?" I said, oh, "No problem." You ever done business over a game of Space Invaders? Uh, no, it'd be a very short business. So I'm not very good at it. It's a tough game, the old Space Invaders, isn't it? Very much so. It's yeah, when they get down low, the anxiety levels increase. I think that's why I avoid it. You know, I'm more of a kind of um, what was the other one? Fe- was it Phoenix? Oh, Galaga or oh, Gallagher's one. Of- Loved Galaga, Charles. Love it. I'll take you on next time, mate. I'm down there. No problem. Sounds good. Now, buddy, uh, as we wrap things up, you're not going to get out of it so easily. What's on your bucket list? Well, my bucket list, Jeez, Timbo. Come on, buddy. Open up your golden nuggets book. Do we do you want to make one up now? So, well, I suppose what I'd like to do is build a sustainable business to a 55, then from 55 to 65, actually contribute to the community in some way overseas. Okay. So I had a client come in, I'd be sort of five or six years ago, and it really sort of struck a chord with me. From 55 onwards, you actually can do something good that makes the world a better place. So not necessarily a payroll, but and certainly potentially something overseas. That's what is on my bucket list. Can you imagine what it would be? Yeah, I'd be happy to sort of teach in the third world or something like that. Um, yeah, right. I, I just, you know, I think something like that would be really rewarding. Like I've had a lot of work with, you know, the Migrant Resource Centre and, you know, Variety and that sort of stuff, and I really enjoy that. Um, and you get so much more out of it than, than what you put in. And it's, you know, I mean, I remember when I'd, I'd do a financial literacy course, course at the Migrant Resource Centre and, you know, these people are new migrants to Australia and, yeah, you just find out how hard their lives have been and you have to pinch yourself sometimes because you realise what, what a fantastic mm. life we've had and how lucky we've been. Yeah, love it, mate. Love your work. Hey, Charles, um, website is main, mainstreetfs.com.au, is that correct? Uh, yep, that's right. And if people want to hit you up on Twitter because you love a bit of tweeting, what's yeah, I still, your tweet? I do like the tweets, still like the tweets and the LinkedIn and uh, things, but, no, but feel free to contact me, happy to help anyone. How, how do they get you on Twitter? Um, at C Baden, that's probably the, the best option. B-A-D-E-N-A-C-H. Charles, love your work. All the uh, success for future marketing endeavours, mate. Thanks, Timbo. Keep up the good work. Love listening to the show. Hey, what a good fella. Hey, do hit him up on Twitter. He loves a bit of Twitter action, does Charles. Now, I've got my top three learnings, thanks to Net Registry, who get your online marketing sorted. Learning number one, do things others won't do to get the results others won't get. Don't you love that? Charles is actually full of quite a few quotes, a few kind of door stoppers, but I do love that one, hey? Little one percenters. Learning number two, hey, check out Google Sites as a way of creating an intranet. I like what they're doing uh, at Main Street Financial with this. I know a lot of businesses that also use it as a place to store all their standard operating procedures and all that type of stuff. In fact, just last week, we held a members-only webinar inside the Small Business Big Marketing Forum in which a Google Apps expert, a guy called Peter Moriarty, who set up all my Google um, apps, he uh, walked us through some of the simple and free productivity tools that Google make available.
available to us. So if you wanted to listen to that, you can go over and join the Small Business Big Marketing Forum at crankmymarketing.com. And that uh, it's about an hour, just a bit over an hour webinar is there for you to digest. Learning number three, are you fishing where the fish are? Sounds obvious, I know, but sometimes we can cast our marketing net a little bit too wide, hoping to catch anything. But do you really want to catch anything? So here's an idea. Set aside an hour or two to trial some very targeted marketing that only talks to people you want as your customers or clients. A bit like the advice I gave up front with that listener question about getting clear on your niche, on who you're trying to target. Powerful stuff. There's a challenge for you. Oh, and I didn't want to burst Charles's balloon, but if you're going to put a video arcade in the office, which I think you should, I would go for the stand-up version of Space Invaders. Much cooler. What do you reckon? <laughs> hey, what was your takeaway? Head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com, key in episode 292 into the search bar, and leave me your thoughts. <laughs> Well, let me see. I reckon that's about it, team. Plenty of marketing gold coming your way, though. Weeks and months ahead. Next episode, I have a chat with a fella. How's this? Who's starting an airline. In fact, an airline in which you pay a monthly fee and you can fly as often as you want. Hey, yeah, true story. More on that next episode. Between now and then, use Net Registry. Get a website from them, buy a domain name, change your hosting, get your website found. They've got great offers over at netregistry.com.au forward slash Timbo. And a big hug goes out to me old mate, Daryl, a.k.a. Delirious Missin. He puts this show together each and every week without an ounce of complaint. Thanks, Daz. And the music bed, the one you hear throughout the show, that's written by Lockie Doley. He's a rock star. Hey, if you need a speaker for an upcoming event, I'm all yours. Head over to timreed.com.au. And if you want to surround yourself with motivated business owners just like yourself, then you could do a lot worse than joining the Small Business Big Marketing Forum over at crankmymarketing.com. Then you've got a place to ask any marketing conundrum that is on your mind without fear of being judged or laughed at. Although we do have a laugh in there. Hey, until next week, I am Timbo Reed. Love your work. May your marketing be the best marketing and bye for now. 